Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Or does it explode? Or does it explode? Or does it explode? Looking for artists. Hello? Hello. I am an artist. Malik. I've heard, heard enough about you to be honored that you're here right now. Thank Don't you. listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever she told you is straight up lies, bro. It's the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> just for some context, um, I started a, um, a company with a team of people, and we're very interested in artist voices. And especially in today's world, it seems like the voices that matter most and that are going to bring. The, the change that we need to see are black voices, voices of color, women's voices. Um, and so one thing that I'm trying to do is check myself, my own privilege, like what can I do to boost the voices that need to be heard? And the team started this podcast called Looking for Artists. And what's cool is that through that, I found a lot of artists that are doing important things Brittany is doing so many important things on so many different levels that it seemed like with where we were, with where I was personally and with, with where I was professionally with Rock Rising, it seemed like this was just the most natural progression of the conversation. So um, I just want to make that clear to you that my dedication is to artists, to people of color, to women, because um, I'm, I'm, I want to contribute to creating the world that 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 we want to live in and that we Absolutely. want to live behind so i'm very very appreciative that you that you agree to do this and while i have questions for you like i'm i'm really here to learn and to listen to what you have to say sounds good to me good is there anything that you want to say or or um or like share before we officially start uh, I'm appreciative to be on here. Uh, LFA seems really, really cool. You know, looking for artists, that's usually what I'm always doing. Um, uh, I'm a brother from, you know, the Bronx, New York, and uh, I actually don't see a lot of people that look like me or have my uh, background in art. So when I get to find people like that and uh, I get to um, amplify their voice, I do it. Uh, and that's something very important to me. So the fact that you're also amplifying my voice so that I can amplify other people's voices as well uh, is the mindset that we should all have as artists is to amplify each other and to push us forward so that when we look behind us and we see someone that is maybe straggling or needs a little help, we can reach back and bring them up to the table or to where we are so that they can also grow. So I appreciate you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. And right back at you. Can you share with us your name or what you're called as an artist, whatever that is, um, and then we'll, we'll start that way. Sounds good. Uh, my, hi, my name is Malik Washington. Uh, everybody just knows me as Malik. Um, uh, I am a dancer, uh, choreographer, and a teaching artist. I don't like to say teacher. I like to say teaching artist. Uh, um, yeah, born and raised from the Bronx, New York. Uh, grew up in Hunts Point. Uh, uh, very interesting that a lot of my life has been uh, surrounded by incarceration, and uh, I kind of use that as a um, uh, a support system to do the things that I do. Uh, a lot of people fear being in a box by yourself, but I think the, the idea of of solitude is something for us to grow a conscience. And as we see that in our time right now, during a pandemic, most people felt like they were in you know, solitude, uh, solitary confinement. Uh, and that made them be able to have this idea to think more and to think outside of the box or to see everything that was happening around them without the uh, interruptions or the devices that they have put in front of us to remove us from the actual thought process 
uh, that we need to have. Well said. What type of art would you say that you make? And mm -hmm. or has that changed since you first started making art? Well, even when I first started making art, I didn't perceive it as art. I just perceived it as my voice. There was things that I wanted to say that I haven't seen uh, seen said or heard at all. And the people that I did hear doing it were the people that I worked with. Um, the, my old bosses, like uh, Kyle Abraham, who is an amazing artist, uh, MacArthur Genius Award winner, Princess Grace winner. Uh, and then right after that, to work with Camille a. Brown. They're both friends. She's an African-American woman who is also a Princess Grace winner and won tons of awards. Um, and I think the thing that I learned from both of them was the idea of the process, uh, the idea of unpacking and being able to uh, actually heal from what you want to talk about, uh, not the idea of just blurting out a lot of words and seeing who will stand up and uh, who will pay money for a ticket, but uh, what is the meaning behind what you're saying? Uh, and of course, for me, it's my body, um, but I, I, at times I, I realized that my body wasn't enough and I needed more voices to amplify, again, the story that I was trying to tell. So uh, as my friend Nigel Campbell has said, it is the idea of radical storytelling. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm using that often because I don't want it to be political. I don't want people to think of it as just black dance or, you know, black choreography because it is bigger than that. Uh, the idea is to shake or to disturb uh, the ideas that you have had in your head, even about myself or about my community or about my race, and to kind of show you a different outlook on how we tell stories. So radical storytelling is what I would call my work and the work that I do with others in collaboration. That's beautifully put. If your community is small of artists that you appreciate, I think this is a perfect time to research and find other artists that you can appreciate, a.k.a. LFA, you know? It's the idea of, yo, we did the research for all these years in these white universities <laughs> to look up all the stuff that they wanted us to look up, but we never researched ourselves. And now we have this opportunity after the, during the pandemic and during this heightened uh, racial tension that people are like, support these black artists. You need to be watching this person and this person and this person. And I was like, imagine if we did this 10 years ago. Like how many black artists will already have been where we see them now, but they could have been that 10 years uh, ahead. And I have a question. What was the first piece of art that you remember making in your life ever? You know what, like the first thing that I ever had to make, I wouldn't even call it art, but I, it was just like a requirement that, you know, somebody was like, hey, we need you to do this, was my LaGuardia solo. Like I had to, this is high school. Uh, me and Brittany went to LaGuardia High School for performing arts and uh, arts, uh, and I had to what I was I had to be like thirteen, and you know they asked you that you have to come in with a solo that was like three minutes, and three minutes at thirteen years old seems like forever, <laughs> forever, like so I'm like what am I gonna put in it? Yo, I, I want to do this and I want to do this, but. Uh, it was the first time that I had to think for myself and create. No one was giving me music. I had to pick my own music. No one was telling me what steps I had to. So that was the first spark, you know, and uh, that moment made it even better that when I got into the school, I got in because I made it. Uh, and then after that, again, it was another moment at LaGuardia where I thought I was actually making art, was making something that was tangible that someone could see was uh, our junior and senior solos that we have to make at LaGuardia. Um, and there were always choreographic um, tasks that I had as a student that Miss Mathesius gave us in choreography. So one was like getting a poem by Robert Frost, and it was about the cricket that was keeping itself warm, and it rubbed its legs together at nighttime, but that's how crickets ended up making sound. So, of course, I took that idea, and the cricket rubbing this, it made me think of a violin. So I asked a violin student to come in and do the duet with me, and I did a solo, and she played, but it became a new duet. 
So that was the moment that I started to engage with the idea of collaboration. And no one asked me to do that. No one told me, hey, we think it would be cool if you get a violin. I was just like, yo, it says cricket. I like violins. Can we get a violinist to come in and play with me? Um, so always thinking outside of the box, always kind of taking another step forward where everybody else is doing, oh, I'm going to just do this as a dance. I'm like, let's go a little bit deeper. How can we make this more meaningful and impactful? So with the first pieces of art that you were making, especially these collaborative pieces, where what were you what do you think you were trying to say um or the message behind it you know um you know what i don't even think i had a message then i think it was just something that i i, I know i needed to do um it it, it called to me <laughs> in a way um but i think the the voice that i was trying to have was i want you to look at me differently uh, especially in times uh, in high school, I was a really hard kid. I was like very tough or I wanted to seem very tough. And I think dance was the only place that I could show my vulnerability, but it also be seen as powerful. Um, and so I tried to use that as much as possible um, inside of that. And trust me, I chilled with the goons. Like I chilled with all the homies that yeah. were, the, were the rappers <laughs> were the, the boys that would just slap box in the hallway and everything. But then I also had to go to ballet class, and sometimes people would try to punk me, you know. So those being a, a teenager while also trying to become a young artist is just like now. You're trying to find your wave. You're trying to find your uh, clarity in things. And um, I, I was lucky enough that I had a lot of insight from people to help me find clarity by telling me to think outside of the box. Like, look at you. You're, you're already outside of the box. <laughs> you're a black kid that is from the hood, that is going to an amazing school, but you do ballet, but you love hip-hop, you know, and then you love rap, so how can you mix all these things in together? Um, and what, 15, 20 years later, all of it starts to make sense when I'm starting to create again. But those were the first instances where I was starting to connect the dots, but only two dots are being connected at a time. Um, so what would you say is one thought that's consuming you this week or today alone? And what will you do with the thoughts that are coming to you? You know, I, I, my, my number one thing is lately just been finding more joy in the world. Uh, and how does that uh, represent through the body and through my, um, my efforts and what I do on a daily basis? Um, yeah. But it, it's, yeah, it's weird because right now I'm kind of not numb, um, but I'm aloof. Like, it's it's all just floating. So it's kind of cloud-like, you know? Like, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm floating across to figure out where I'm going to land next. Like, we're, we're satelliting, if anything, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just orbiting around, watching everything because I'm working on so many different things. Like, I have, like three projects this week, working in three different organizations. Then there's multiple interviews. I'm just trying to stay attentive so I don't miss anything. Uh, I think that's the thing. And I think that's what's happening to a lot of artists now. We have to focus in even more to make sure that we're not doing the wrong thing because what right now is the whole idea of cancel culture. Mm. So wow. this idea of accountability, uh, I have to make sure I'm on my P's and Q's, crossing my, uh, crossing my T's, dotting my I's, so that no one tries to come at me and try to sun me or try to say, yo, you wasn't doing that before. But no, everything that I'm doing now is everything that I was doing before. I haven't changed. I did not switch up. My integrity stays the same. So I think it's the idea of clarity, satelliting, and integrity. I have one final question. Um, just what are you currently working on? And is there anything that we can support you on specifically as an artist? Uh, currently, I'm working on uh, <laughs> my show. <laughs> the, show that, the show that I did with Brittany Kamau and Chet called uh, Shadows, Shadows of Heaven. Um, and it's a piece that I, I've created. It was about my dad and our 16-year uh, our hiatus while he was in prison. And uh, I felt that he was in solitary confinement, but I was also put in solitary confinement as well by being a young man that had to stay you know, in, in uh, this idea of a box of to be a good boy um, uh, and that growth and that 
exchange that I didn't have with my father, but kind of rerouting it and re envisioning it that he was being a mentor to someone else in jail. That piece is something that uh, I really believe in strongly. Uh, Shadows of Heaven is something that I created in the Bronx uh, three years ago. And uh, now it's been in its third, like, third... uh, Version or iteration? Yeah, I would say third iteration. Uh, uh, You know, it's morphed a couple of times, and now we're trying to work on, you know, some other aspects of it to heighten its... uh, it's it's flyness it's um it's it's just dope and i love it um besides that you can also check uh out camille brown and dancers that's the company that i dance for my boss is an amazing woman uh she just uh choreographed while i assisted her as well on uh porgy and bess the uh metropolitan opera they just showed it on pbs about two days ago and they'll be showing it again on the 24th uh, for a live stream, so please check that out. It is a wow. four-hour um, opera, but imagine 90 African-American people of color uh, opera singers performing on that stage and telling stories that resemble us and that look like us. And to be honest with you, if it wasn't for that show, there would probably be no Metropolitan Opera because they pulled them out of the red. Every show was sold out, and that's over 13 shows. And if you know opera, that money's big money. So we talking about there was no standing room tickets. Wow. Right. So, and then to be connected to that, to have my name on that, uh, to scroll down. And uh, I was just like, you know, my mom was crying. Like, family went to go see it. Uh, I had friends that flew from across country to come and see that show. So those are the moments where I, I really feel inspired about what I do, but also about who I work for because Camille finds it very important that representation in the room is very important. So all the conversations we're having now, I was having for the past two to three years with her. So I I was already prepared for what was going to come next, uh, for what is happening now. So when people are asking these questions, I know exactly what to say. And it wasn't because I've been coached to say it. It's because we've actually been going on tour for the past three years and those touring situations where you have a Q and A at the end, I learned so much about what the eye and the, what, how human beings see black bodies move on stage and how they, they pin things to us. Like I was jumping really high one time and the guy was like, why don't you just turn, change the whole stage to a basketball court? And I was like, bro, I don't play basketball. And then my boss came out and she like took the mic and she was like, so now why does he have to play basketball? Cause he's black. Thank you, Camille. <laughs> Ask the real question. And so having someone that doesn't take she, – she's not going to subside herself to someone when they ask that question. If anything, she's going to bring it to the point. So the things that you can always support me on, Camille A. Brown, myself, uh, my uh, Instagram is just my name, under, uh, Malik underscore Washington. You can check out my website. It's MalikWashington.com. Um, and there will be a lot more shows coming up. Uh, in the near future, virtually, of course, obviously. Uh, and then I'm trying to think of something that I can do physically uh, where people could come see but still keep that distance. So that's something on my mind. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Thank, Thank you, brother. You. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Brittany. What is your name? And... Um... What, what are you called, maybe, even as an artist? Okay. My name is Carl. Uh, I go by Summer Dregs uh, in my production work and in my artist work and in uh, everything, even in life sometimes. So Summer Dregs, what type of art do you make? I am a producer, uh, a music producer, and, uh, yeah, composer, engineer, uh, I love producing is actually my favorite thing. So working with artists to bring their vision to life is that kind of connection brings me life. Uh, but then I also have to make money. So I make, I do commercials, I score commercials. And uh, if someone comes to me and says, I want to I have all this equipment, I don't know how to use it. Can you record me with it? I will do that also. What is the first piece of art that you can remember making? Probably 
some uh, a piano recital that I was at that I remember it being a very scary experience and I like stopped in the middle of the song and my hands are like literally shaking. Uh, this is one of my first memories of ever playing piano. And maybe oh. this is, I want to say uh, like eight, maybe. That sounds about right. That's like third, second, third grade. Um, and it was a terrible experience. And I don't know why I uh, decided to just like block that out of my memory for years and keep doing that. But I, I did. And because I don't think anybody at that time in my life was like, man, you're really good. Uh, that did eventually happen. But I don't know. Something really drew me to that. Maybe it's because it challenged me. I'm still like that. When somebody sends me notes for a song that they want me to change, I'm usually like, you know what? I'm going to make this even better than you ever imagined. Challenge so, accepted. Exactly. That's exactly how I am. Yes. <laughs> Tell us a thought that is consuming you either today or this week. And what do you do with the thought? Or what are you planning to do with the thought? You know, and we're making a lot of decisions about, uh, I have uh, kids going into third and first grade. Ooh. And we're making decisions about school, um, which I feel like is making me think about um, my childhood and how I was directed by my parents, you know, you can't help but be directed by your parents in your life. Mm -hmm. And and what brought me to where I am and what what I like, what I love about my life, what I don't love about my life, what I don't appreciate about that. Um, and my first reaction when I'm having those thoughts about my past is I'm a very like future thinking person. So I usually push those off. I usually just like, I have very few regrets even things that were clearly bad decisions. I'm like, I was a different person then. Mm -hmm. I, I could only have made that decision. Same. Um, but I also don't think that's true. And I having kids, like I do need to revisit that. Mm -hmm. And, but while also not swinging too hard in the other direction where, you know, my parents, I feel like they gave me very few tools to, to think about a career with. Like I was not thinking about my career uh until i like after i graduated college which is like probably six years too late you know and i don't want to be like with my kids like you got to choose your career now you're eight years old <laughs> you know <laughs> can we have a childhood please <laughs> yeah exactly so i'm just saying like i'm i'm trying to like to to think about uh what could have steered me into maybe just, just thinking the right way. And again, my children are not me and they may need something totally different. Yeah, th that's kind of what I've been thinking about. And that spills into everything. That spills into what jobs I take. Mm. Uh, even, even down, I'm in a position right now where I'm having to say no to things. And when people ask for more than, than they're paying for, I have to be like, uh, no, this is not what you paid for. I'm a Enneagram nine and that's, like really hard for me <laughs> to do. Um, but I, I'm just thinking like, no, I need to think about like me and my family and my community and what I want for that and not just keeping peace uh, in my life. Wait, can you say that last line one more time? <laughs> that was good. You got to say it again. That's right. I, I am thinking about me and my family and my community and, and where I want to go and where I want to be with that and and not only thinking about keeping peace all the time. That's major. Yeah. Because it's actually more about keeping peace for the other person. It's not even because you're not at peace. Right. You're letting the other person or people define what peace is. And that's the problem. Um, right because <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot that's a whole that's a whole other show actually that can happen just off of that line yeah the should we make an album about that can we, do that? <laughs> can we just do that that, that is definitely a, a component of the album uh me and michael are working on um 
is definitely uh, how how do we move how do we look at where we're at uh, seriously without being in despair, especially in this moment. Uh, like look at it straight on, but then also be hopeful about the future. You know, and how do we move on? So those two things: being honest, you know, but also moving forward. Uh, after kind of everything's been wrecked, uh, all the plans at least, not everything, you know, I still got my family and my health and stuff, but uh, just lots of plans wrecked and be like, take that seriously. That's real. You can grieve that, but then also you got to keep going. Tell us a little bit more about the project, how you guys decided to start doing it, when it started, all of those things, as much as you want to give. We started putting focused effort towards a couple tracks, maybe what five or five months ago. Mm. And then you came here for a great trip, and then we recorded two songs, and then Corona happened, and we were like, "Wait, we have a few more songs that maybe we could work on." And then Carl was like, "Let's just keep working on music." And I was like, "That sounds great." And so that's basically where we are. So I think we're working to complete an album. Don't we have a meeting later tonight? Yeah, we do. Yeah, so that's where we are. And then if there's any other details that I missed, I I don't know. I just kind of, yeah. So from my perspective, I kind of was doing a bunch of singles with a bunch of artists just to get, just just to kind of meet a bunch of artists and do a bunch of work kind of all at once. Um, The production stuff is relatively new in my life. You know, the commercial stuff before that and then the band stuff before that. So... I was basically meeting artists, doing single songs for them. Michael was one of those artists that I approached and was like, hey, let's do a single together. And um, that turned into two songs. And I was like, okay, well, yeah. So then I came up to New York, recorded them. We vibed like just really, really hard. And, um, you know, that thing, I don't remember if we were recording or not, but just talking about like, getting notes and trying to keep people from getting in their own ways i felt like every decision michael made i was like oh yes you just elevated the song and every decision i made it was the same thing and not every decision like we still have disagreements you know it's a relationship but when that happened i was like okay i want to be well no it wasn't even until corona hit because i was like let's do maybe a couple more songs and we'll bring Michael down to Chattanooga and we'll keep this relationship going. Uh, Corona hit, all my work dried up. You know, I had two mixing jobs canceled. I had two commercials canceled, just like all in one week. Because uh, artists didn't have money because they weren't playing shows. Commercials weren't shooting, so I wasn't scoring anything. Um, and then uh, I was like, well, maybe I should just make an album with Michael because like that. Yeah. <laughs> I as well but I think you know we all had that moment uh not everybody but I had that moment where I was like why am I doing music you know it's not making me money right now um nobody's asking me to produce tracks for them right now uh I have nothing going on like am I going to just take a break because I can mm-hmm. you know and I think you get into that when you when you're an artist that's getting paid for their art mm-hmm. and, I will never, ever complain about getting paid for my art, but you can lose sight of like why you started, you know, and and I would feel like I was able to refocus and, and really point to Michael and a couple other collaborators that we have on this project and be like, oh yeah, this kind of connection uh, and the music that we're making too, the actual product we're making is why I started doing music. Well said. Uh, that's the bright side of Corona. Uh, <laughs> maybe well, the only seriously. bright side. Seriously, seriously. I, I said early on um, when Corona first hit and everything was shutting down, I started to understand quickly that we were as much, I 100% agree that a lot of the deaths, people being ill is awful, but being granted time to reassess, reevaluate, and get clear about certain things regarding yourself in general and why we do the things we do. 
I don't know if we'll ever get time like that again, to be honest. I don't know. And I'm grateful for it. I truly not, am. Not all at once, for sure. No. no. That was a collective consciousness moment. <laughs> that was everybody get clear. You're being given an opportunity at the same time to clear some shit. Yes. So let's do How can we support you as an artist, Summer Drives? Um, so I would love for you to listen to my music. Uh, um, spread it around. Summer Drags, it's, I'm on, you know, all the services or whatever. If you want to hear a promo of our album, like hit me up. I might send you one, but I might not. But I probably will. Uh, but yeah, mostly mostly listen to my music and, and spread it around. And if you do need uh, commercial work, I do that. You know, you, you got to pay me, but mm. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm really good. I hear you. He, yeah, you are. You are. He is. Brittany, he is. It is what it is. <laughs> Seriously, though, to you, I feel um, boosted by you, brought up by you, um, in the sense of, like, you always bring me up in life and... Yeah, I have a lot of love for you. So I'm excited that you agreed to do this. Forever grateful. So yeah, let's let's end it, right? That's hot. All right. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, Carl. Marisol, you look great. Brittany, you look great. And I look passable. Should we do <laughs> what? Um, okay, so are you you guys wanna start? You start. All right. <laughs> so I have context for who you are. We know your name, but for those that are joining us on the video wavelength right now, um, what is your name? What, what do you go by? What's your artist's name? What's all of it? My name is Marisol. I'm a visual artist. Uh, I also go by abstract Marisol. Uh, she, her. And right now I work for an arts enrichment program that focuses in after school, which is strange to say out loud right now because everything's in limbo <laughs> with the Department of Education. But I'm still, you know, working hard to create spaces for young people um, to be artists, so. What kind of art do you make? Or would you say that you make? I've been saying abstract for a long time, but it's a lot of line work and painting. Um, I'm big on details. I freehand everything I create. I'll have inspiration based on the conversations I have with the person I'm creating for, but it's mostly like lines and um, bright colors. Um, and I'm also trying to bridge that gap between uh, painting on canvas and um, making film. Uh, I'm going back to school in September, virtually, you know, and uh, I, <laughs> I hope to learn more so I can um, align those worlds. That's awesome. Have you had any um, gigs in your life, gigs or jobs that like directly align with that and help you see that to fruition? Um, I worked with A-STEP, Artists Striving to End Poverty, and um, they work with kids all over the world in certain communities. Um, and I volunteered with them um, to do events with kids. I've taken it upon myself to go outside of my building and paint and invite kids to paint with me. Um, well, during that experience, um, I think we talked a little bit about it the last time I was on um, LFA, but um, I was really ashamed growing up of where I, where I was from, like Marcy Projects. And um, during my time with ASAP, I learned a lot about what community meant. And um, just because you're part of a community doesn't mean you're invited to go in and change it. Um, so I started talking to people in the neighborhood 
and um, creating outside. Um, and in that, kids started coming downstairs to paint with me and work with me. And actually, I created a community, a Black Lives Matter community mural um, a few weeks ago, and we put it in the community garden for everyone to see. And I was talking to the woman who's had this garden for 29 years plus, and she was like, it never occurred to me to put a mural in this garden, especially one with Black Lives Matter. And she was like, you know, I feel like a local celebrity because now people are coming to take pictures. And she was like, and you know I'm shy. I'm very shy. I don't talk to anybody. I stay in my garden. I plant flowers. I don't talk to nobody. But with this mural, um, it's created a space for me to talk to people and take pictures of people. And she was like, and I don't know why you didn't sign it. You didn't sign it. You need to come down here and sign it. So it's been interesting how that mural in particular has created conversation for a lot of people in the neighborhood and people who I wouldn't typically like feel comfortable talking to or I'm not gonna lie who I've judged before I've even like allowed myself to be open enough to have conversations with um but it, it's really interesting what art can do um I had an event I think two years ago I was invited to um have a booth at Raw Artists um they're an awesome organization. And um, it was the first event that I had been a part of that I hadn't curated or collaborated with a friend. And I was really excited about it. I brought some pieces and there was a woman who was um, kind of lurking by my booth and she was keeping her distance. And I was like, come over here, let's talk, like what's up? And she was like, I, I don't wanna get too close. I can't afford any of these pieces, but I just wanted to talk to you and say, you know, she gave me some kudos on my pieces, which I appreciated. And then I took a piece off of the wall and I gave it to her. And she was taken aback and the energy got a little like, what's happening? And I was like, I don't, I, I understand. Like, this is for you, you take it. This is my Instagram, hit me up whenever. And she just said, thank you. This really made my day. I've been going through a lot right now. Um, and then she walked off and I guess she enjoyed the rest of the gallery, but she recently hit me up and she was like, I just came into some money and I'd like to commission a piece. And it was a full circle moment because the struggle is really in these streets, but also like that energy came back to me when I really, really needed it. And so I created a piece for her. Um, it was like two halves and, and I sent her a picture. Thank God she liked it. But I just thought it was such a beautiful moment. And like the same way I brought her healing in that moment, she brought me healing during this time. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, with the media and all the shit that's going on in the world right now, sometimes the focal point is just the negative, like what's wrong, what's not working. And when those moments happen where you get to like really reconnect with people or just connect in general, that brings healing. So. That is beautiful. I guess that, that makes me want to ask this next question. So what is the first piece of art that you remember making that you would call art? I mean, I remember creating things as a kid and giving it to my mom. Like I was giving her like something sacred and gold and just like looking at her reaction. And like me and my mom have had a rough relationship. And a few years ago, I found this um, this like suitcase that she always kept really old dingy and I opened it and it had every piece of art me and my sister had ever made her every card everything from pre-k she even had um, letters from when we started writing like hmm. a b and I, I was just like yeah like my mom is everything um, but I remember making things for her when I was younger but as an adult the first piece of art that I made that I was like, wow, I made that and I'm really proud of it was the piece I gave to my cousin because it was the first painting I ever put on a canvas. Even though um, I didn't make it with a paintbrush, I used a pen and I kept dipping it in the acrylic paint. And then for a varnish, I used clear nail polish because I didn't know nothing about varnish or whatever. But I was so proud of that because I was like, look what I did on the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> what did. And she still has it. She still has it. Oh, um, just kind of off that point of like how crazy the world is right now, like what is something that is consuming your mind? Just a thought that's in there either just for today or this week or recently. And what are you going to do with that thought? I've never been more aware of 
being a woman of color than these times. Like, I've always, like, been like, yeah, I'm proud to be Latin Latinx. Like, I'm proud to be this, that, uh, uh. But I've never, like, been so aware of it, especially in my work setting. And on Juneteenth, my supervisor started the meeting by saying, we are a white organization. And I stopped him. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, and he said, and his response was, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't frame it correctly. It's today is Juneteenth. And therefore, I want to bring up um, the fact that a lot of all the leadership in this organization, with the exception of me, is is white. And so that created space for com for a conversation. However, it wasn't properly prepared. Oh. And, it, and, and it was crickets. And so he asked a similar question, which was, what are you doing with all of the what all of the information right now? Um, how are you? What did he say? Uh, how are you? Uh, how are you contributing? Mm. Like, and so I sat with it for a second, and I was real. I, I told him, I said, I've been learning how not to be reactive, how not to be the angry person of color in this space because there's a lot of hurt mm -hmm. like real hurt deeply rooted shit that i didn't even realize existed within me um and sitting there i was looking around and i was like oh shit like i'm really the only boss who's a poc you know and not that i want to use that as my narrative mm -hmm. not that i want to wear that everywhere i go but it's real and with that comes people who want to learn with many questions. So Marissa, with everything that's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, how, like, how are you dealing with it? How can I be an ally? And it, mm -hmm. at first I was like, get the fuck out of my face. Like, I'm not, the, I'm not the voice of the people. I'm not like, and I'm dealing with my own hurt. I'm dealing with my own stuff. I'm dealing with looking on my window during lockdown and seeing protesters like dodge bullets and like jump in the community garden and hide behind that mural that I made, you know, like some real shit. And I had to stop myself and be like, okay, you get to control those emotions, what you do with those. You get to feel how you feel, but you also get to create space for conversation because it's also an opportunity, you being the only person of color in those spaces. And so yeah. I had to really go home, do some reflecting, do some woosahs, some breathing, <laughs> um, and, and come back to work with like a new mindset. And so when those conversations and those questions are asked of me, I go, this is an opportunity for me to really like heal, teach, and bring some authentic like love, which is needed right now. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been trying to, in my own hippie <laughs> way, bring love into those spaces because that's what we need. We need some love. There's a lot of hurt right now. And also accepting that it's okay. There's no right answer at times. Like, you don't always need to be right. I don't always need to be right. I have my experiences. You have yours. Where do we find the common ground so that we can get out of that and really have some real conversations and get work done? Because in, in a position of leadership, people are looking to us to lead, to guide. And how do I how do I do that? I mean, and the way I do that is just be my authentic self. I'm fucking hurt. I'm scared. I'm sad. I'm 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 worried. But I also have this other side of me that that's love, um, that that is open to connect. And there are people out there who are just standing in that rage and that hurt and not allowing any room to have communication. Um, and that's not okay, but that comes in their own time. Everyone's on their own journey with this. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Beautiful and perfect and wonderful. So I guess give us a little bit more insight on what you're working on currently and how we can best support you from today forward. What does that look like? Um, I guess I have this massive canvas behind me. Yes. <laughs> I have, and I'm working on this, and it's due next month at the end of the month. Um, I, 
I'm I'm committed to, to making that happen. Um, my process is very much like my heart needs to be beating really fast so I can go. Like I I work really well under pressure. The de- if I can see the deadline, I'm like, uh, okay, yeah, I need to get to it. And that's typically when my best work happens. Um, this this conversation in general, knowing that there are fellow artists out there who are creating spaces for conversation is a support. It supports more than you know. Um, social media also can be an illusion sometimes. You see a version of things, but having real conversations where people are like, yo, like, it's, it's hard. Like, that's, that's a big support for me. Um, so if I ever, like, hit any of you guys up, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going a little crazy right now. This is a like, real way. Is, yeah. Wait, look, I just need to say this, actually, real quick. One of my favorite things about working with Rock Rising, and one of the real reasons why this is happening for me, is because I do run in a lot of different artist circles. And while I can appreciate a lot of what I see in them and what comes out of them and the work that comes out of them, one of the things that is hugely important to me is having real conversations <laughs> with people for real, real. Like I don't, I'm not interested in image, hype, mainstream, commercial, anything. There's nothing we're pitching. It's just us <laughs> and the work. And, and I think I can, I, I feel confident in saying this about both of you and myself. The work comes from a real place. It's not, I don't feel like any of us are artists or creatives because of something external to us. It starts inside. Mm. So I, even in terms of deciding who we wanted to have on this, it was like people that I've had real encounters with or people who when I've seen their work, even if I haven't worked with them creatively, I felt like this is a real person. <laughs> like They're not putting on for me. They're not putting on for the world. They're just like, this is where I'm at. And this is how I use my work. So I just wanted to say that. So yes, girl, we could talk all times. Collaboration, <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> more community, all the things. Okay. <laughs> I'm really excited. <laughs> Are you accepting permissions? Julie wants to know. <laughs> so you can find me on Instagram at abstract muddy soul um there you can find any information and i'm accepting commissions also art exchanges so if you have a piece that's just sitting in your house that you don't know what to do with i'd be happy to create something and potentially exchange it so let me know hashtag art access love that thank you muddy soul thank you you are appreciated likewise likewise Welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, even though I have reference for who you are, very special to me, uh, whoever's watching may not know these faces. So let's just start with maybe, uh, what's your name? Who are you? What are you called? Uh, Mark Wilson. Um, I'm from Hampton, Virginia. Uh, I would I always call myself an artist. Um, I do everything. So uh, people know me for painting, uh, design, graphic design. Um, but for me, it's a lifestyle. Um, anything I see, I could twist or turn it. Um, nothing really belongs or belongs. So I play by those rules in any space that I'm in. Uh, like you can see my wall back here is just like, whatever I need or how we gonna make this happen, that's me, so that's who I am. <laughs> yeah. So even though your art is obviously <clears throat> expanding to every part of your life, like you, you said, lifestyle, um, if you had to categorize it, um, not limit it, but categorize it for somebody who may not be as immersed in an artistic environment as you are, what would you say is the kind of art that you make then? So <clears throat> I would say me speaking to you in a gallery, um, 
I am very, I use a lot of slang. So when I say slang, I'm saying everything. And so I'll say that I, I got the wild piece on the wall, but my art friends have told me to say, I make abstract expressionistic work. And so that's what they title it. But I just say everything. Um, I am a self-taught artist. And so um, with my art, I go by my own rules and the skills I've learned and build on. So with my terminology, I also match that. I don't want to confuse myself as natural as it is. So I do play by my own rules in terms of my wordplay describing my art. It's well put. So I have a question. What would you say is a thought that's consuming you either today or this week? Just a general thought or idea or feeling that's been kind of consuming you lately. Um, I've learned to very flow naturally with life and not be consumed. Um, the last time I interviewed with Michael in New York, I was very consumed and had a very strong ego um, as an artist. I wanted $50,000 for my art. Um, currently, I'm able to just kind of release. And I would say that was just my practice uh, through religion and giving it up to God. But uh, the thing that's consuming me now is my commissions. So right after I get off the phone, I have some digital work. I got some clothes and some paintings to get done um, that'll last me for the week. Um, and I'll make it through the week. I got some things coming up this week. So if that answers your question. Uh, it does. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So you wait. I have, one, I have to say some, ask something else. So you schedule... You're, you're pretty good about scheduling time to work on your art. I work until the sun goes down. Um, I only do that so when the sun goes down, it's nine o'clock here. That gives me time to clean, eat, and shower every day appropriately as an artist. Um, before I start art, I need to clean and eat. Um, before, I would just go the whole day and work without eating. Without, and I also go for a walk every day. Um, so th that that will be my routine. I'll come back from my walk, I shower, I go do art until the sun goes down. Sun go down, I do the things we need to do every day as like self-care. How long would you say it took you to kind of like get that concept locked in? It's been a gradual process. So even since I last saw you, um, I would say every week, every month feels like a new kind of step towards that direction. And so I would say, yeah, this has just been gradual, about two months now. What is the first piece of art that you can remember making? When I was in elementary school, um, I was, we were making calendars and we every month had to be a certain theme and i did it like really quick like killed it easy and my art teacher was just like i need to talk to your parents right now and i was like what but the community that i grew up in and my mindset at the time was not to stand out or not to be special and so I, I just completely shut all of that down immediately. Like, what do you, don't ever try to do this. Cause I just wanted to fit in with everybody else in the class. Um, and so, yeah, that's a very vivid memory. My dad always brings it up. He's like, remember your art teacher said you could be an artist one day? And I'm like, yeah, you should have invested in me. And, <laughs> but I'm just playing, it's all love, it's all love. I have to ask something. So you remember shutting down that natural inclination to kind of show your work and, and stand out in those ways. Do you remember what sparked you picking that back up? So my creative light has always been uh, oppressed um, as a child and being a football player and being a black male that's kind of like 6'2", 235 in high school you coloring what you gonna go get on that field and so um my parents um nothing against them but they grew up north carolina country you know what i mean they hear rock music from there 
six-year-old child, they're like, what is happening? Yeah. We need, yeah, go in the room. We're going to have a talk. Um, and so playing football in college, again, I'm a muscle head. It's like, but it's always been in my mind to create a business, but I didn't know um, it would be art. I always knew I could do art, but not, I wouldn't tell nobody or practice art. It was just like, I see something, my mind always tells me how to make it. And so I never thought that was a gift. I was just like, everybody can make that. Like, you like that, I'll make it. And so um, since it's always been in my mind, once I moved on my own, I literally was able to just do whatever I wanted to do on my time. So you told us a little bit, you know, you told us a lot about yourself and about your journey as an artist. But what we would really like to know before we close out here is how we can support you going forward. Like, what can we do? What are you working on right now? Is there anything that you want us to know about? And what ways can we help you out? Um, Rock Rising does a lot for me. Um, they're amazing. Uh, so... I can't ask for anything else from them. I'm gonna be honest. Uh, but more than me, I would say I am trying to get a message out to people. If you see artists' artwork that you like, buy their work. I don't care if it is four hundred dollars for an eleven, an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper that they completed. When you buy somebody's work you are literally sending a direct post to their heart. Like you are, I don't care what they went through that day. Like some people might cry after that sale. People don't share what they are going through. Artists don't, they, it's already another step that artists have to go through and share. I was very egotistic. So I threw my stuff out there, but for people to show up and showcase I got to set up my table. I got to bring my art. Some come so clean. Like a compliment goes a long way. A like, share, but buy a piece. Spend money. You will get your money back next month when you get paid or however. But that $400, able to change somebody day or week, they tell their mom or dad, their brother or sister, now you got momentum. The ball is rolling. And so I need you to, I like their work, I'm gonna buy their work. You have to give artists money. Money, I hate to say it, but it's not everything. And either it's gonna fill them up and tear them up inside, or you're gonna see what you planted in your community. And then that's the end, but yeah. It's all love here, bro. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, until next time. Thank you. See you. Hey, okay, here we are. We made it. I want to start with this question. Brittany, what type of art do you make? I make art that seeks to create connection and vulnerability through dynamic performance. And that can kind of come out in the form of acting, poetry, a lot of spoken word stuff. I sing sometimes. It really doesn't matter the medium. Um, it's more about the message, usually, what I want it to do. What's the first piece of art you remember making? Mm, okay, so, uh, okay, okay, okay. There was a time when I was a wee tyke. <laughs> a little person in elementary school when I did storytelling contests. Mm. And I think there was a, a story in particular called Abby Yo-Yo, which is based on a South African lullaby. I don't know why I'm remembering this right now, because I think this is the first time I've actually mentioned this <laughs> since I did it <laughs> as a child. But what I'll say is I remember we had to learn the book, read the book. I'm maybe eight or nine. Learn the book, read the book. Um, and then you have to tell the story. And like, that's the contest. And there's like a little bit of folk singing kind of in it. And I remember 
I just remember telling the story. I remember watching other kids tell their stories and do their things. And I remember when I did mine, uh, my version of the story, two things happening. One, I remember how vividly I could see what I believed uh, the characters looked like, how I really thought they sound in my mind. And, and therefore that was really what was coming out. Um, and I remember how people in the audience were watching and kind of being like, what is happening? Not in like a bad, she's weird, get her out of her sort of way, but in a kind of like, this is different. And I saw like the lean forward thing happen where people are kind of, and I remember being like, okay, this is different. This is something different that I'm doing. I'm using one thing and I'm kind of making it something else and allowing people to kind of experience it the way I see it and hear it in my head, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I think that was the first time. It's very fulfilling to watch an audience experience what it is that you're saying, because if they're experiencing it, it means that they've listened and that they've resonated with at least something. This next question that I, that I guess I have prepared for you <laughs> is framed in a way, it's like, tell me a thought that is consuming you today. What, are you, what do you want to say? So I'll answer the first one, what's consuming me right now, right now. Yep. This, this past, um, I'd say week, there's a quote by Queen, there's two things that have been consuming me and these are all connected, I'm now seeing. Um, there's a quote from Toni Morrison, the goddess, that is Toni Morrison. Um, I don't wanna say the whole quote because I'm sure I'll butcher it, but the first few lines always, and if you've ever followed me on Instagram, you've probably seen me posted in my stories at some point. The function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work it keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. That quote. Those lines. Um, connected to that, justice for Breonna Taylor. She's a black woman who was killed while asleep in her home. I'm a black woman. That's hard, right? Grace, a 15-year-old girl, black student, who's been in a juvenile detention center since May during a pandemic for not completing a homework assignment. I don't know how to, to wrap my head around these two stories, these two incidents. I don't know how to make sense of nonsense. I don't know why those who killed Breonna Taylor are still free. I don't know why a 15 year old girl who suffers from ADHD, who was struggling with online learning um, and couldn't complete a homework assignment would be sent to a juvenile detention center during a pandemic. I'm like, ADHD is a difficult thing to struggle with. I have a younger sister who struggles with it. I don't even have ADHD and with the pandemic and everything that's going on racially right now, I can barely focus and complete a damn task. Um, Toni Morrison, the serious function of racism is distraction. As a child, I was very aware, too aware, of what was going on in my community. I saw firsthand um, what crack did in Harlem to communities, to families. I saw my mom struggle to raise us and not, and in a lot of ways, not be able to pay as much attention or engage as much 
because there were so many different things she was trying to navigate and fight against, which all could be tied back to uh, systemic racism. I think as a kid, I was trying to figure out my space, trying to understand uh, what the world was doing around me. I was finding solace in telling stories in reading stories and attempting to distract myself from the world around me by diving into the stories of other people. I jumped around a lot, but in my mind and in my heart, all of those things are connected. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I think the connection is there I think the connection is clear to me because I see it in your life. I see you actively doing things about it. So I guess my question for not only for me to be better informed, but for other people, AKA you, if you're listening, um, what are you doing with those thoughts? And then what can we do with those thoughts? So I think the thing that's interesting is I'm still doing a lot of what I did when I was a kid, which is looking for opportunities to connect through different mediums, to tell these stories, to share information um, through, through the lens that's most honest to me, doing it in the most authentic way, and also holding space or leaving space for the many different ways that that can manifest itself um, I think also I operate from a very authentic space and I make clear uh, what my stance is on these various issues very early in my knowing of people in hopes that I can continue to connect with like-minded individuals in order to partner on collaborative creative projects to tell more of these stories, to challenge uh, the various mediums that we all work in as artists to be more versatile in their storytelling, share more of these stories so people are just more knowledgeable about the fact that these different experiences exist so that there can be more understanding amongst people. I think at the core, it's just seek to understand the people that are sitting across from you as often as you can. Ask questions, not from a place of opposition, not to battle, but to truly understand. And then what you receive, seek to figure out from wherever you sit, how to use that. So for me, sometimes it's protesting. Sometimes it's um, signing the petitions. Sometimes it's calling the, the, the offices and emailing the people. And, and sometimes it's sharing things on my social media. And sometimes it's partnering with a like-minded person like you and saying, how can we create more spaces where we can have important conversations about that which plagues us constantly? And creating space for there to be more vulnerable, open conversation about these things and about where our, um, uh, our need to shift consciousness really comes from, where it originates from. Um, I don't think I've ever shared with anyone uh, the story, me, the, the fact that Abby Oyo was the first story I ever told. Uh, it talks about people who are ostracized for being different, essentially. And <laughs> who knew? I don't know if I really understood that at eight or nine years old, but it rings true to me right now. Um, I think that the, the overall thing I would say is that it's important to just not be afraid to start from wherever you are. I, I, I don't think it's ever a mistake that we're led to the things we're led to. If you have a certain amount of visibility or you see something a certain way, it's not by mistake. 
there's something for you to do with that. And I think sometimes that's a lot of what the work is, is kind of sitting with the feelings you have and, and, and taking time for yourself to figure out what you can do. Does that, does that read, does that resonate? <laughs> it resonates, it does. And I agree that if there's, if there's any growth that's to happen or redemption to be talked about, it is in the process of what we can achieve through open information and sharing that information. Because, you know, if, if we're sharing information and we're listening to one another, then we can actually hear, you know, we can hear from other sides and start to hopefully the goal is ultimately to build a better world. Which yeah. leads me to kind of like, you know, this project and the next question which <laughs> is, you know, what are you, what are you currently working on right now? Mm, okay. There's a, a few different things. <laughs> there are always a few different things at once that are being worked on. Um, one of which is obviously this project, right? We're, we're developing together this, creating uh, this space for artists of different mediums, of different backgrounds, um, of different forms of training and study to come into these spaces and talk not only about their art, but also talk about how they use their art and how they use their art to deal with a lot of the things that happen in the world, happen in their world, and happen in their minds and hearts. That's how I see it. So this is something that is very important to me right now. I've worked on panels and been a part of a series of conversations, especially recently, um, surrounding a lot of what's been happening. And I've, I've found myself so often in these spaces of having people ask me um, how they should go about either being an ally or what they should be doing to help, you know, navigate what's happening right now and, and, and how do they fight and how do they and what whatever that looks like and I found myself in this weird place of like why is everyone asking me this question <laughs> like like I have this let me uh, let me hand you a job real quick here's what you can do um but I think I am very good at helping people clarify thought and helping people clarify purpose and I think that this space is another way for all of us to do that um with each other for each other and with the listeners and, and people who will be viewing it. Um, so that's one conversation. The other conversation is there's another guy who's on the show, Mr. Malik Washington, who I am working with, continuing to develop a piece that is centered around his life story, um, his, his challenges as a black man growing up in the inner city, uh, what mass incarceration did to his family, to his father. So. That was another one of those wonderful opportunities to tell a story that really resonated with me as someone who grew up in the inner city in New York and saw those things firsthand. Um, and that's another part of that work of sharing information, sharing the story. Like, as much as it's about creating and performing, ultimately all of the work is about sharing. Um, and then the final thing that I'm working on that will be released this month is what I will call a poetic EP. And I'm intrigued. I know you are, so I saw that. Like, like what you said? What did you do? I'd call this a poetic EP of sorts. Love it. Um, it is the first volume slash version of a story that basically tells the story of two people who fall in love on site and how the exploration of those feelings and navigating something that seems so foreign yet so familiar helped them to find self-love. So that's the high level story. Because through all of this, um, and going back to that Toni Morrison quote, you know, it's not just about the distraction of racism keeping you from doing your work, but sometimes I feel like it keeps you from living a full life. Getting to explore love, getting to be happy, getting to be joyous and that being okay, even while the world is crazy. Um, and I really wanted to, to write stories that still made space for that stuff, for the love, 
for the magic of that and for what you can find in yourself through those things. It's almost like providing the access to that, that love that is immediate. This literally would not exist without you. Um, I, I'm so grateful to you. And every time that you are in a part of my day, anytime I hear anything you say, I'm better for it. So thank you. That's love. I appreciate that. And yeah. you. Can we end it? We can end it. Well, it's just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to end the recording, but not the meeting. Okay, cool. All the love. Thanks for watching. You ever see somebody's whole heart? I mean all of it. Even the wounded parts that they've mastered hiding? I have. And I wasn't even looking for it. Wasn't even looking, and yet, there it was. Bright, and big, and powerful. Damn near blinded me. Took my breath right away, made me stop right there. Stop thinking altogether, brain just shut down, out of order, stop fighting. Whatever it was I was fighting that week made me pay attention. And with all the attention I was paying, I couldn't hear a note he sang. Couldn't even see the step, and the boy can hear the step. Didn't even know the story he was telling. Just, just, just that, 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 that heart. And then he looked at me. And I just knew he saw mine too. I mean, I had been hiding mine real good, mind you. But it didn't matter how good I was at hiding it. He saw it. And his eyes, Lord. I thought I was breathless before. <laughs> Looking in his eyes, I could see that he remembered what I know now I had forgotten. Him and I were one once. One of those times before, before this now. And it must have been something, something good, better than good, magic. It must have been magic, because we were caught. Couldn't look away, couldn't stop looking, seeing him and I taking it all in, overwhelmed and overwhelming. And I never even gave him permission, you know? Never once. I never once told him he was allowed to see me. But he didn't seem to care about that. Just, just, just kept, kept looking, looking, looking. And I was looking too. I mean, look at him. How do you even not look? Who knows how to do that? I mean, how do you even not look at him asking for a friend? Me, obviously, I'm the friend. The one who can't stop, won't stop. Looking? You ever see somebody's whole heart? I mean, all of it. Even the wounded parts that they have mastered hiding? I have. And now, I can't seem to see anyone else.